It's reminding ourselves that our measure of success is not what people think and how many likes we get, but how we measure our learning and our growth, just learning to appreciate how much you have grown and come forward is an incredible skill that you need to nurture and practice. And that is going to take you places because the more comfortable you feel with failure and getting up again after small failures, the more successful success you'll have. As I always have said, the people who end up succeeding in life are not the ones for whom things come easily. They are the ones for whom obstacles are just something to transcend and the ones that get up every time that they experience a failure in their lives and they keep going. What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of The Artist of Data Science. Be sure to follow the show on Instagram at The Artist of Data Science and on Twitter at Artist of Data. I'll be sharing awesome tips and wisdom on data science as well as clips from the show. Join the free open mastermind Slack channel by going to bit.ly.com forward slash Artist of Data Science, where I'll keep you updated on bi-weekly open office hours that I'll be hosting for the community. I'm your host, Harpreet Sahota. Let's ride this beat out into another awesome episode. And don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review the show. Our guest today is a physicist, data scientist, and TV host. Through sheer force of passion, persistence, and perseverance, she became the first Mexican woman to graduate with a physics PhD from Stanford University, where she studied under Nobel laureate Stephen Chu. And she accomplished this despite growing up in a conservative community that discouraged young women from studying or pursuing careers in science. By leveraging her expertise in scientific research and advanced analysis, she has helped many organizations automate their decision-making process and uncover patterns in large amounts of data. And she's cultivated a specialty in drawing connections between the approaches used in data science and the challenges faced by organizations. She's the chief data scientist at Metis, where she leads the creation and growth of exceptional data science training opportunities, such as boot camps, corporate training, professional development, as well as live online programs, all while also developing a world-class data science instructional team. She's also the co-host of Discovery Channel's Outrageous Acts of Science TV show and co-host of the TV show Humanly Impossible, produced by the National Geographic Channel. She's taken her STEM research initiatives globally, empowering and encouraging women in places like India, Israel, Mexico, and Costa Rica. And her work has been recognized by the likes of the Wall Street Journal, Oprah, Dr. Oz, CNN, TED, DLD, and Wired Magazine. So please help me in welcoming our guest today, a woman whose passion it is to inspire young women and minorities to pursue careers in STEM, to think deeply, to be bold, and to help others, Dr. Deborah Burbich. Dr. Burbachez, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to be here today. I really, really appreciate you being on the show. Oh, thank you so much. That was a wonderful introduction, and it's an honor for me to be here. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So, so let's, let's talk about your path into data science. What sparked your interest? Where did you start and how did you get to where you are today? Uh, yes. Yeah, so I think it was a serendipitous path in that I didn't really expect to become a data scientist. I had never heard about the term, uh, maybe about 15 years ago when I had finished uh, my PhD I, uh, I started working in Wall Street like many physicists because I wanted to be able to get a green card and stay in the U.S. And uh, as you know, there was a strong connection between the financial markets and the Ph.D. programs in physics and math and statistics uh, across the country. And so it was kind of uh, not it wouldn't even raise brows. There were over uh, a few thousand uh, physicists working in Wall Street. 
And uh, so I uh, finished two postdoctoral fellowships after Stanford at Columbia University and at NYU at the Courant Institute in applied math and applied physics. And then I started uh, working in, in physics and I realized that academia was a bit too isolating for me and I wanted to communicate more with the public and uh, evangelize uh, different uh, products and have an impact with my coding and what I was doing. I did computational physics, by the way. And so it was pretty close to data science. I just would not, we would just not call it that. Uh, but I had never realized uh, that what I was doing was a very narrow form of data science, meaning I, I was... Uh, you know, quite proficient with a particular aspect of machine learning, but when it came to uh, data science, which was much more vast uh, than what I was doing. And so I was humbled uh, by an experience I had at Strata, the big data science conference, when I was interviewed on video. And I think I said something that I, I, I've regretted saying ever since, which was, oh, but come on, data science is nothing new. You know, we have physicists and, and Wall Street people uh, doing it for the past 50 years and nothing has changed. And, and you know, I was uh, proven wrong uh, quite quickly because uh, we definitely were analyzing things with different algorithms and we were analyzing different kinds of data that, that we never analyzed before, such as audio and text and images and, and whatnot. Uh, and, and so there, there there were a lot of differences and also in data science you we require to translate the insights that we gained into quite uh you know lay uh and entertaining terms so that the stakeholders uh in a company could actually enact uh policies and 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 change things in uh, via the company into a different direction to gain success based on those uh, insights. So that's how I started. I, I finished uh, my postdocs. I worked in Wall Street for six years, and then I realized that what I was doing in Wall Street was research and, and again, do, working with data. It was the stock market data to be specific, but I also uh, knew that I wanted to have more of an impact in the world and do good for uh, people. And at the time I had uh, been following my friend, Hilary Mason, who's a renowned data scientist, and I loved her work. And I saw Kathy O'Neill and other people do uh, use uh, uh, the data science analysis they, they did for you know, bringing more ethics in, into the world and, and, and more visibility into underserved uh, communities when it came to uh, doing uh, data science work. And so I ended up wanting to uh, connect education with data science. And that's how I came about Metis, which is where I'm the, currently the chief data scientist at. And we're a data science training company where I've had the chance to not only train people by teaching a machine learning bootcamp uh, and create curriculum, but also where I've had the chance to do Metis for Good projects like helping create a live uh, map of, uh, re of needed uh, things during an earthquake that happened in Mexico about four years ago and people could go to the map and in real time see what kinds of items uh, or people were needed in different locations. So it's been uh, a, a, a wonderful uh, world of work where uh, I can actually not only help people but also educate uh, companies and others in data literacy and that's what I, I've loved about my work in data science. What's up, artists? Be sure to join the free Open Mastermind Slack community by going to bit.ly.com forward slash artists of data science. It's a great environment for us to talk all things data science, to learn together, to grow together, and I'll also keep you updated on the open bi-weekly office hours that I'll be hosting for our community. Check out the show on Instagram at the artists of data science. Follow us on Twitter at artists of data. Look forward to seeing you all there.
So that's pretty awesome because you've been able to apply your expertise in a number of different uh, domains. So I'm, I'm curious as to your thoughts. What do you think is going to be the next big thing in data science in, say, the next two to five years? Yeah, so I think that a lot of data science has been slowly partitioning into more and more specific professions. We have tried to capture a vast amount of things under the umbrella of data science. And that has not worked well because companies have been hiring data scientists, uh, some of whom have expertise in data management, others uh, more in sophisticated algorithms like deep learning, and others more in in a a more statistical-based data analysis. And so I think people want to know what they can get out of data science. And so we're seeing the proliferation of dashboards and easy platforms like Tableau that are going to be able to be used within an organization with very little training. That is pretty much anyone will be able to have access, having an initial training to the data that a company has and people will have insights at every level. So we're going to see that and those people are going to be translators or bridging bridges between the executive level of the company and the company's data. And so we won't need to hire a very um, kind of heavy engineering background or data science backgrounds for those uh, things. At the same time, as algorithms, uh, sophisticated and more complex algorithms become successful at solving certain problems, we're going to see more people hire specific bends within data science. That is somebody who is exclusively uh, an expert in NLP algorithms or in visualization techniques and whatnot. And so I think that more and more jobs are going to open, but uh, we're going to, they're going to require more specific uh, skills and more training in certain areas, as well as people from less technical backgrounds having access to uh, more commoditized platforms. So in in this vision of the future you have, what do you think is going to separate the great data scientists from the good ones? Oh, that's a good question. I think somebody who has the skills that I call critical thinking will definitely advance way more than a good data scientist. So we could define a good data scientist as somebody who is able to efficiently manipulate, clean, and gain insights from a data set that have actionable metrics that can propel a a company or an institution's uh, business forward. Whereas a great data scientist will be somebody who can think outside the box and outside of the established algorithm can uh, both go back to the basics and make sure that the statistics are correct, which a lot of people don't think about now, and not be deceived by, say, the sample that gather the data, the, the agenda behind the data source or the company that's providing the data and whatnot and really gain deeper insights by creating an algorithm that specifically tests what they uh, know they want to test with with metrics that are as specific as to, you know, the errors uh, that get uh, propagated uh, with uh, statistically measuring uh, only a sample of the population and whatnot and really paying attention to how at every step of a data science project we can unintentionally or sometimes intentionally propagate these errors and misuse data science to gain insights that are eliminating from our goal the the vision uh, of a comprehensive uh, truth, so to speak. Like we can, you know, test a voter uh, data set by eliminating unconsciously the opinions of certain minorities or certain other political views. And of course, then gain insights that are not actually representative of what uh, the political ecosystem is. 
So what do you think will be kind of the scariest application or the scariest abuse or misuse of data science and machine learning um, at, let's say, in the next two to five years? Yeah, so I think a lot of uh, data science is now being used for analyzing sensor data. And by that, I mean that the data that we analyze no longer lives in a screen in a computer, but is actually living in sensors that uh, health uh, companies have that people are going to wear on their bodies, for example, to measure the amount of a a medicine they have to take with a a sort of a a sticker that punctures the skin and they measure the amounts of a particular medication in the blood. Those are out there already. We're going to measure, we're going to put sensors in offices, in manufacturing plants, in clothing, in our scales, in our bathrooms, in closets in you know go figure in like all kinds of things and when all of this data uh, which is many times communicated to other platforms unsecurely gets used by different companies with different agendas that's where we're gonna see a cross-section of data being abused and being misused so for example while it may be useful for parents across the world to have cameras in their homes to check their baby babies uh, at night, if they're moving or crying or whatnot, we see that there's a website for specifically for Internet of Things products called Shodan uh, that is out there where you can find lots of data from open cameras that have been put not only in baby uh, rooms, but in uh, back of restaurants and, and whatnot that are just simply open because the security protocols have not been put in place. And the these data have, of course, the potential to be uh, abused. So, you know, we're going to see that I think that in the Internet of Things and in sensor data, we're going to have to be very thoughtful about how we engineer our future and the communication between all these platforms. Yeah, I mean, that does sound really scary, especially about the baby monitors. Uh, my wife and I just had our first baby three weeks ago today. Oh, and- congratulations. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And I have a baby monitor in his room. So right after this, I'm going to go check the security settings <laughs> on that thing. So, okay. So on the flip side of it now, let's talk about, you know, in what ways do you think data science will have the biggest positive impact on society in the next two to five years? Well, I do think that data science done well is going to expand the reach of pretty much everything that companies do. So, for example, banks tend to lend money to a particular set of people. And in the past, that set of people was... uh, that had access was typically the one that was sort of set, uh, had a social profile that was pretty recognizable, had a certain salary and uh, lived in a certain area and and behaved in a specific way. Whereas now we are uh, gaining more insights into how minorities or people with different profiles behave when borrowing money. And so more companies are going to feel more comfortable, for example, lending to people who don't fit exactly that profile. We're also going to have more transparency. So I have a a friend, for example, Dan Ariely. He's a behavioral economist. And very cleverly, he's looking at data of how companies treat their employers. And probably uh, we're going to be able to create a financial index of, you know, the companies that treat their employees better may may well be the ones that are profiting uh, the most. And so we're going to be able to invest in them more. And so we're going to shine light into uh, different areas of society that were invisible before. A project that I really like, for example, was MIT's looking at trash and what happens to trash. So this is an IoT project where they basically put GPS chips into 3,000 trash objects in Seattle and they follow them for two to three months. And they saw that in the beginning, the trash objects went everywhere shoes and cartridges and old batteries and whatnot. But after a few months, they saw 
uh, very clearly how some markets developed. And so print cartridges, old ones, get uh, reassembled and go to Mexico because it turns out that it's expensive to buy new ones and so they inject them with ink and they reuse them. So there's a market for that. Whereas alkaline batteries went to Africa for a similar reason, they get recharged and they get resold in a different market. And so by just adding a chip, a sensor, and making that data visible, we can inform governments, trade unions, and, and other stakeholders about how to manage these markets better, reduce tariffs or open uh, ways for these markets to thrive, and so on. So I think the, the most amazing things that are going to happen are uh, giving transparency to industries and to communities of people that otherwise in the past have remained quite invisible. That's really interesting. It definitely have, has given me and, and will definitely give our listeners a lot to think about and a lot to research on. Thank you for that. So I was tr trying to think of a clever way to sneak this question in, but I think the best way to do it is just ask. Yeah. Uh, it, in doing my research, I came across uh, came across you mentioning your obsession with Tico Brahi. Yes. Uh, can, can we talk about, first, first of all, if you give us just like a, a synopsis as to who Tico Brahi is or was uh, yes. and, and, you know, what your obsession is with him and, and, you know, the biggest thing that we all can learn from him. Yes. Oh, thank you for asking this question. In fact, you are going to find this funny, but I have an 11 month old son whose name is Tico because I am so uh, in love with the figure of Tico Brahe that I named my son after this uh, famed uh, astronomer, Danish astronomer. So, uh, and it's a very unique name. I think there were, when we checked uh, the census, there were only five kids in the U.S. with that name. Uh, so uh, hopefully, Hopefully it'll be a trend in the future. But anyways, yes. Yeah. So when I was growing up in Mexico City, I was a very curious and inquisitive child. And I always wanted to know more about the universe and math and physics. But I was discouraged from pursuing a career in STEM and, and science because I was a woman. And in this conservative community, they told me that I, I shouldn't uh, really dedicate myself to something so male dominated and that I should pick something easier and more feminine like marketing and, and other things. And so I started to read behind everyone's back books about obscure physicists like Tycho Brahe who did amazing things in their lives but did not count with a very healthy uh, social life because I just thought that would be me in the future. So Tycho Brahe was this Danish astronomer. He was a noble man and actually visited uh, the island, which is now in Sweden. It's part of Sweden nowadays, the island where he lived. And I visited his beautiful observatory underground. And it was just an incredible moment for me. But basically, he, was, uh, he didn't have such a great personality. There were rumors that he fought in a duel. And the king expelled him from Denmark. And then he, after fighting in this duel, he lost his real nose. And he had to wear a nose... Uh, an artificial nose made for him out of copper and all that. However, as a scientist, he was magnificent. He, out of 8,000 observations of the sky with a naked eye, remember we did not have big telescopes back then. He had this, he built the most precise equipment at the time uh, that were instruments to be able to track the movement of stars and across the sky. And with, you know, they say big data is everything. Well, with a very small data set of only 8,000 observations, he was able to pretty much give the, the foundations for deriving the laws of planetary motion that Kepler uh, later did with Tycho's data. In fact, it is said that uh, Kepler kind of stole the data and used it to make his assertions and, and his axioms. So, you know, Tycho was a very interesting figure, extremely dedicated to his craft of being an, an instrumentalist and a scientist. And so I always grew up thinking that maybe I'll be like him. I'll be rejected by society in some way, but I'll have my observations and I'll have my science with me. And that, that's how I felt, isolated from the world for liking data and scientific discovery, but somehow in love with the process. And he became a kind of a silent hero for me. And, and now I think I've taken... Tico Brahe's teachings to the next level because I didn't, I wasn't content with keeping them secret. I actually became a science communicator because I, I have 
very strongly seen how much people are helped by increasing their their science literacy. And I am a very strong supporter of uh, making people learn and educate others in the basics of science so that we can become empowered citizens and, and know more about the world. It's a very beautiful story. Thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. Thank you for uh, asking. <laughs> so, so we talked about the what's going to make the great data scientists, and you mentioned critical thinking. Uh, yes. Can, can you talk to us about what does it mean to you to be a critical thinker? Yes. Critical thinking to me is about questioning authorities. I teach a course, uh, The Art of Deception in Data Science. And I can't tell you how many examples I take from publications that are as reputable as the New York Times. And then they put a graph and they say, you know, doubling of income in this area or doubling of the number of voters. But when you look at the actual absolute number, it went from like, or, or a doubling of efficacy of a medicine. And it goes from like 0.001% to 0.002%. Okay, yes, you doubled it. But in objective measures, you, it's really still not very efficacious at all. And, you know, yes, you doubled the income, but it went from uh, you know, one dollar to two dollars. Like, what does that say? And so, there are uh, there are ways of presenting data, of visualizing it, that is meant to intimidate or to deceive people. Or sometimes it's done even unconsciously. And so, the y-axis, you know, is cut at a certain point, and they don't display the full size of the bars. Or uh, some, you know, it's presented. Something's presented not in logarithmic scale when when logarithmic next scale would be more appropriate, etc. And so for me, critical thinking starts there. Okay, let's visualize, let's look at, at, at what the news are giving us. Who is benefiting from this kind of insight and this kind of, of result? Uh, what's in their agenda? Who owns the data? Who is doing the analysis? Like, is this uh, medical equipment company paying for the data analysis that showed that that particular equipment is is you know super efficacious for for you know their health study or not so you know asking questions about the data asking questions like did this take into account communities of underserved communities to conclude this this is take into account women's voices and and whatnot like all kinds of questions that you can ask and we at metis have a, a course on um, data science literacy that equips people with the skills and the tools to basically analyze what they see and all the visualizations that we see every day on linkedin on facebook on marketing campaigns and, and allows us to, to gain uh, the proficiency in being able to discard lies from the truth. And that to me is critical thinking, or at least where it starts. Do you have like a, a actionable tip that our listeners can take with them so that they could cultivate a habit or mindset of critical thinking for themselves? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I always say go back to the sources. Every time you read something, pretend that the person who wrote it or the agency that put it out there has absolutely no authority. Do not trust authority. And that's something that Feynman, a physicist, used to say all the time. Do not trust authority. And not only that, but Feynman also said it's very easy to fool other people, but it's actually easier to fool ourselves. So Make sure that you recognize the biases that you have about the world and what you want to be truth so that you don't blind yourself to the actual results uh, of a data analysis. And so when people do data or even when people read about things, make sure that the evidence presented is something that makes sense to you. Like check the sources, check, check, you know, why people are forming these conclusions and you'll become a much much more informed reader. At first, it's going to be difficult. Like you're just going to want to trust the sources. But after a while, you realize how many of the things we get bombarded with 
are actually not true or simply the research has been done incorrectly. And just uh, equip yourself with a basic statistics course and learn what are the, the typical ways that we get deceived and, and we do statistics the wrong way so that you can be armed and be the voice that critiques that out there. Because, hey, this Facebook uh, post here doesn't seem to be true. You know, the, the research... Uh, does not support these conclusions actually because of this and this and that. And I can't tell you how incredible and empowering it is when you can actually become that voice of reason. So why are humans so bad at, at appreciating or conceptualizing probabilities? I think because we live in a world that is extremely complex and we have uh, so many factors that could be credited for bringing about some result. So even in science, you know, when I see uh, something fall or something behave in a certain way in the natural world, it's a multi-factor problem because it could be caused by angular momentum here, but it could also be... and, and you know, the, we, we dealt with that in my TV show because during the filming, we would actually have to discern what were the most important factors governing some crazy thing that someone uh, posted a video about on YouTube. Like, did, did, did they uh, roll down a mountain uh, by being inside a, a, a truck tire uh, and not injure themselves because of the rate of rotation was so fast that it overcame the the tires inclination to to fall sideways or you know like all kinds of things and so when we see uh, the world and so many factors that could be causing something it's very difficult for humans to entertain those equations because they're very hard and long and difficult to solve so i think that's why humans human brains although we have good intuition we also make a lot of mistakes in guessing where people, where, where things uh, are coming from. So in statistics, it's kind of like the, the adage with like enough data, anything can become statistically significant, right? So for, for data scientists out there who are working with vast quantities of data, why is it important that we cultivate this intuition for what this probability represents? Because you can be very easily fooled. There is a story that Marissa Meyer, who I, I admire uh, very much, when he was uh, uh, still working at, at Google, there's a story that she was very meticulous and she tested the exact shade of blue in which uh, the, the Google search engine would report the, the links. You know, when you search something, every link is, is, has a, a beautiful blue uh, color. And, and she tested so many shades of blue, like maybe hundreds, to figure out through A-B testing which one was the best one, you know, the one that, that had the best response from people. And she felt and the the reports and the press said, okay, so they found the perfect shade of blue. However, there's something in statistics, too many repetitions can actually lead you to come up with a false accuracy because you test so many shades of blue that by pure probability, you can end up getting very high response for one particular shade. And it's not because it's true, but it's by fluke. You had you know, that in that run, that effect happening. So we're, you know, if you question the results, you were really never sure if that was actually the best shade of blue or that particularly, uh, that particular run happened to uh, give those results. So it's very important to question that in a business and to question the decisions that, that people are, are doing with data. So, Make sure that you understand the statistics and what's happening when you test something with an algorithm, that it's very, very useful so that you can actually report the right conclusions to your boss or to management at the executive suite and not report your bias or what you think should be happening. Are you an aspiring data scientist struggling to break into the field? Well, then check out dsdj.co forward slash artists to reserve your spot for a free informational webinar on how you can break into the field. That's going to be filled with amazing tips that are specifically designed to help you land your first job. Check it out. dsdj.co forward slash artists.
Thank you for that. So kind of shifting gears a little bit here, I'm wondering how you view data science. Uh, do you view it as an art or as a science? That's an excellent question. And I think I caution people who view it as an art because although there is definitely an art to it in the skill of um, you know, doing exploratory data analysis and whatnot, I do think that the best data scientists are the ones who exploit the sort of scientific process of going through meticulously proposing or systemically proposing algorithm after algorithm, each one more complex, but trying many different ones in a systematic way to figure out which one can read the data best especially when we have, when we get to more obscure algorithms like deep learning. Uh, I like to think that people who are taking that approach have already exhausted all the more open and linear and clear algorithms that exist out there. Because many, many times we can, like in physics, the, the, the best solution is the more elegant and economical one in the sense of you know, the, the one that requires the least amount of data and effort. And so I think data science is, is quite scientific in, in that sense, but definitely because it's not getting a fixed solution to certain problems, there is an art to it, which means that data in the end is subjective. We capture it by subjective means like polls and um, questionnaires and whatnot and different data. Price of a stock is influenced by a lot of uh, human subjective measures and behaviors. And, and so no matter how we try to uh, make something fit into a, a particular system, it may not because it doesn't follow rules like the natural world. And so we have to accept that there is an art to it. And to the extent that uh, people are open to multiple interpretations, uh, I think we, we, as long as we know the limitations of our results in data science, then we are able to call it a science with huge error bars sometimes. Thank you. I really, really, really enjoyed that response. Um, I was curious... How, how do you think the creative process tends to manifest itself uh, in data science? You know, I write, I like to write. And so when I write, which I consider a creative process, I first write my thoughts in very concrete, in a concrete list of items, so to speak. From there, I try to connect those thoughts. And after that, I try to create a story that links those thoughts together and puts them in a context so that people can relate to the story better. And that's an art because I could come up with, you know, various ways of connecting those thoughts and various ways of putting a context to them. And uh, so that's a very artistic process. So in the same way, I think a, a good data scientist sits down, looks at the data and performs some exploratory analysis in the beginning and says, okay, you know, what can I do with this data? What are, what are the basics? What, what, for example, let me do a linear analysis just, you know, very quickly and see what it says or let me see you know let me just visualize the data does it cluster you know amongst a certain direction uh, what is it telling me and so when we do that we are able to see uh, more of that uh, artistic process take place because it goes from very basic facts and looking at the data to creating a story that can encompass what's happening with the data and what the data is telling us and how it's going to affect change when we use the insights that came from it. For people out there who are trying to break into data science and maybe they feel like they don't belong or they don't know enough or they aren't smart enough, do you have any words of encouragement for them? Yes. Uh, I think data science has really brought the barriers uh, down uh, for, for doing things uh, that are technical in the world. You know, it used to be that you, you really needed a very powerful computer to do astrophysics and you needed to be, you know, extremely good at manipulating multiple dimensions in your head to be able to visualize things. And now with data science, I think anybody can get into the field. We, we have 
high school girls that I've mentored that know how to analyze data uh, extremely well. You know, they may use simpler tools like Excel or uh, you know, something else, but, but they're able to gain insights from, from data very, very quickly. So know that there are various ways in which you can become a data scientist from a boot camp to learning on your own, learning in, in university. We at Metis have amazing boot camps where we also find jobs for people. And don't be intimidated by it. You're probably going to be better at some aspects than others, but the field is vast and, you know, some companies need data science interpreters who are better at communicating the technical details. Other companies need people who are better at engineering and others at the algorithms and, and whatnot. And so there's always room for different backgrounds, different skills, and it's all about gaining confidence from uh, where you came from to where you can be, not about comparing yourself to the, the skills and successes of others. So in those moments where we feel like we're failing or we feel like failures and we want to give up because it's hard yes. upskilling and, and learning so much to get into data science, what, what can we do to feel like a hero? <laughs> uh, you're probably referring to a TEDx talk. I, I get how to be a hero when you feel like a failure. And I think it's reminding ourselves that our measure of success is not uh, what people think and how many likes we get, but how we measure uh, our uh, learning and our growth based on what our growth was before we took on an enterprise. Just learning to appreciate how much you have uh, grown and come forward is, is an incredible skill that you need to nurture and practice. And that is going to take you places because the more comfortable you feel with failure uh, and uh, working and, and getting up again after small failures, the more success you'll have. As I always have said, the people who end up succeeding in life are not the ones for whom things come easily. They are the ones for for whom obstacles are just something to transcend and the ones that get up every time that they experience a failure in their lives and they keep going. Those are the ones that get to the end. Absolutely love it. Yeah, and I was referring to that TED Talk. You've got some of the most inspiring TED Talks that I've listened to. I listened to all of them. Oh. So they're really, really uh, Amazing. I'll make sure I link them to our listeners yeah. as well. And that point about the obstacle is very important. Um, I've been on a stoicism tip recently, reading a lot yeah. of uh, Seneca, Marcus Aurelius, things like yes. that. And my husband loves the Stoics. Ah, uh, that's they're amazing. I, I yeah, mean, I feel like I've been a Stoic for quite some time, but I never put a label to it. But yeah. I think what Marcus Aurelius says is um, the impediment to action advances action. What stands in the way becomes the way. So the obstacle is the yeah. way. Do you have any tips for those who are coming from a non-technical background? Uh, maybe they've been in their career for you know maybe 10, 20 years in like a IT type of role, but they're coming to data science and they're coming face to face with these foundational concepts for the first time and are feeling a bit intimidated. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you one of the most successful data scientists of all time, my friend Hilary Basin, uh, had hired an English major and other non-technical people to be data scientists at her amazing company, Fast Forward Labs. So I always say that, um, you know, any, it doesn't matter what your background is, you can have like the most uh, incredible insights and you can be very, very good at working with data. Another thing is in our boot camps, we sometimes get applicants uh, that have non-technical college majors or we even had an applicant who joined our boot camp in San Francisco. He was 17 or 18 years old and he didn't even have a, a, a university degree and he actually wanted to do the boot camp instead. And to our surprise, he's the first one in his cohort to get a job as a data scientist. And so the advice is to, not, again, not compare yourself to others and believe in yourself because everybody brings a unique gift and a unique perspective to a company. And you may have 
uh, what's called domain expertise, which is incredibly useful. You may just be an amazing uh, collector of, uh, I don't know, old cars or old paintings or something that happens to be what the company is trying to do. And so you may come with you know, data science skills that are not quite developed yet, but you may have some domain expertise that happens to be incredibly useful. What would you say would be like the biggest myth that people tend to hold in their heads about breaking into data science? And would you mind debunking that for us? Yeah, I think one of the biggest uh, myths that I've seen is that people doing data science are geniuses and are like really good at every aspect of data science and and they have a very skilled por portfolio of doing all kinds of data science when that's actually not true when you really look at uh, very good data scientists yes yeah, some of them are 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 quite good at uh, many uh, different aspects of data science but Believe it or not, the vast majority of people working in data science are quite good at one, two, or three areas and types of algorithms. You know, you, you, you shouldn't strive to acquire very deep skills in every area. You should strive to know how to speak about all the various aspects and possible algorithms within data science, for sure, have a general enough knowledge, but do not strive to become an expert before you get your first job. Uh, you know, just, you know, become proficient at one, two or three areas out of the hundred that exist. And, uh, you know, the ones that are your favorite, the ones that lend themselves well to your background or your skills or what you want to do and market yourself for that to get your, your first job. And in that job, you're going to grow and you're going to learn more in-depth things about your specialty, but also more things in general about data science. I absolutely 110% agree with that advice. Um, the same advice I tend to give my mentees as well. I, I think now would be an excellent time for us to, you know, talk about um the Rupesh story so would you yes. would you mind would you mind sharing that with uh, with our audience sure so I said I grew up in a in a conservative community that discouraged me from doing science and so when it came time to pick topic I picked philosophy in Mexico because I was told that philosophy asked questions about the world kind of like physics and then uh, I started studying philosophy for two years and my hunger to do physics and learn math did not go away. So behind everyone's back, I applied to schools in the U.S. because I learned that you can have a double major. And I won a scholarship to Brandeis University, which was very helpful because my parents couldn't have afforded to pay an American school at the time. And, and I had a, only two years because I was a transfer student to pursue my degree. And when I got to Brandeis, I realized that I had the courage to take an astronomy class, which was a very generic course. And there, I, where I finally had the courage to study some physics, I, I had uh, the fortune to meet the graduate student who was a teaching assistant for this class. His name is Rupesh, and he was from India. And he was studying a PhD in astronomy. And he and I became good friends because he said I wasn't the typical student that just wanted a good grade in the homework. He said my eyes would open up and, and would be bright asking with questions about the universe and the planets and whatnot. And he was the first person to truly believe in me. So when I told him one day that I didn't want to die without trying to do physics, he helped me meet with the graduate um, student uh, committee, uh, the head of the graduate student committee, and uh, who also was the head of the, the physics department, and said, you know what, somebody else did this before you many years ago, Ed Witten, who's, by the way, the father of string theory in physics. And he said, if by the end of the summer, in the next two months, you're able to master this material, and he handed me a book which was vec uh, vector calculus in three dimensions, uh, which was an alien language to me at the time. 
of course, I didn't even remember algebra well. And he said, if you're able to master this book and we'll test you on it, we'll let you skip through the first two years of the physics major so that you can cram it all into in the next two years and finish with a BA in physics. And so Rupesh was incredible because he decided to devote his entire summer to mentor me. And he tutored me every day. And we didn't really have a lot of time because it was two months to cram the first two years of math, physics, and calculus, and algebra, and uh, everything, classical mechanics, and thermodynamics, and all of that. And at the end, uh, it was a successful thing because I was able to graduate with highest honors from physics. And the reason why I tell the story of Rupesh is because I always wanted to pay him for all that he did for me. And he cited a story of when he was growing up in India, in Darjeeling. An old man was climbing up the mountain where Rupesh lived to teach him and his sisters math, English, and the tabla, a musical instrument. And whenever Rupesh's family wanted to pay this old man, the old man said no. The only way you could ever pay me back is if you do this with someone else in the world. And basically, that's what Rupesh did with me. He said I could only pay him back by making this my life's mission, which is to inspire and encourage other people and other minorities who, like myself, feel attracted to STEM, but who for some reason, being social or financial, feel that they cannot achieve their dreams. I feel like you've repaid Rupesh a hundredfold with all the amazing work that you've done. Um, Thank you. You should let him know. <laughs> okay. Definitely. So, uh, you know, a lot of data scientists, they're working on projects and they might feel some hesitation or some fear because they're trying to make their project perfect before releasing it to the world, before putting it on their GitHub. Uh, do you have any tips for anyone who is in that mindset? Yes. If you ship it when it's perfect, it's too late. That's what they say about startups. You need an MVP, basically a minimum viable uh, product. So, you know, usually uh, if you, depending on the project, of course, if you're creating a product that's going to be used uh, by consumers, it does need to have a certain level of, um, you know, ability and, and, and perfection to it. But if you're analyzing data, I, I would say, you know, red optimal, 20% of the way is already uh, way ahead of where you started. So even an exploratory data analysis can discover so many things that I say communicate early and perfect later. Always communicate with your team, communicate, communicate your initial results and, you know, get a bunch of people to think about what they mean and what are the next steps because be, instead of working uh, like crazy and perfecting something and you're going down the wrong path, it's best to catch those potential uh, misleading paths from the beginning and just, you know, get to experiment and see what the data is telling you from the get go so that you can have even, you know, less perfect results, but at least uh, ones that are true and represent reality. So switch gears here again. I was wondering if we can speak about your experience being a woman in tech and if you have any advice or words of encouragement for the women in our audience who are breaking into or are currently in tech. Sure. So unfortunately, we haven't advanced as much as we've uh, wanted to in the area of uh, equity and, and equality uh, for women in, in the tech world and in other areas. And so my advice is uh, somebody uh, once told me, ask if, act as if, meaning uh, don't let the perception and the stereotypes that have formed your unfortunate biases govern what you do and how you behave. Act as if you're confident. Act as if, even if you don't feel confident yet, and, and things will happen for you. Uh, and things will be there. And, and uh, also, I, I want to say that there are different uh, modes of leadership. It doesn't mean that women have to imitate the, the typically stereotypical male uh, modes of leadership and, and be assertive in that way. What, what it means is that you can be 
you know, still uh, yourself with your own qualities and maybe you're a, a quiet leader. Maybe you, you like leading people by writing and not by, uh, you know, leaning in, in a meeting and, and making lots of comments in meetings. There's always a way for you to become a leader. Seek that way and seek mentors out there that believe in you and they're going to propel you to the top because the ones that get to the top uh, probably need uh, in this time, uh, somebody that helps them, that believes in them, that helps them, you know, with a few steps in that uh, corporate ladder here or there. What could the data community and, and men in the data community do to foster inclusion of women in data science and AI? Yes. Make them role models, promote women, seek women uh, to hire them for the roles that you have, uh, put uh, technical women in vi highly visible roles. If you have a conference that, that your company is going to sponsor uh, or you're going to attend, send your technical woman to speak. Make women role model visible. That's the best you can do. And you mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit more about the initiative you led to develop the first high school curriculum for data science uh, for girls. Yes. So Moody's Analytics contacted us and we were a group of seven uh, women that wrote and executed the first data science curriculum for high school girls of underserved backgrounds. And it's now being deployed by Girls Inc., uh, which is a wonderful organization that helps to equip uh, young women, uh, especially of underserved backgrounds, with uh, the skills to succeed in life and in their professional lives. And so we teach uh, in high schools, we train teachers, to, uh, we train them to do our specific curriculum in, in data science, of course, with tools that are freely available. And then we find internships for uh, these high school girls, and they get to work in uh, various companies doing some simple data analysis or visualizations or even working with Excel. That's not free, but you know, a lot of companies have it. And then we, we get them to ex experience what it's like to be part of the ecosystem in tech and, and, and uh, data science. And that definitely changes uh, the li their lives because by having that experience and that example, they're way more likely to select a, a technical career in the future. And of course, that improves their professional lives in many ways. Um, I think it's so cool that you started that up. Last question before the lightning round here. What's the one thing you want people to learn from your story? You can make your dreams come true, no matter what. To not believe in what people think of you and what your abilities are. To always seek uh, for that inner voice that tells you what you want to do and believe in yourself. Because we're all prone to uh, uh, fall prey of what the media tells us and what even our well-meaning family and friends tell us. But only we know what we can achieve because we are the ones that are going to put all the effort into making our dreams come true. I love it. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump into lightning round here. What is your data science superpower? Oh, being so uh, detail oriented. I love like checking code and I can, people who miss a comma or something, I'll find the error it, like faster than anyone. <laughs> so what's the most outrageous act of science that you've come across? Oh my God, our entire show, Outrageous Acts of Science, is full of them. Like, uh, you know, I've seen people in my show do outrageous and insane things that I never thought a human could do, like jumping, uh, you know, flying on the, the close to the surface of a mountain with a, with a flying suit and nothing more, not a parachute, nothing like that. Uh, or people jumping off of buildings and, and uh, you know, all kinds of things. So I think it just takes an hour to uh, look at an episode of our show and then you'll realize that uh, nature can be outrageous. So we're going to get a little, little deep, little philosophical here with the next couple of questions. Okay. What would you say is the most fundamental truth of physics that all human beings should understand? Physics is not about facts. That the way they teach us science in school many times about, okay, choose the multiple choice and there's only one right answer 
uh, is not the right way to do science. At the same time, of course, it's not that science has multiple answers, but that physics and other sciences are an iteration of ever increasing approximations to the truth. Meaning that, uh, you know, when people, Newtonian mechanics is still true, even though Einstein modified it for certain contexts in which we are traveling at the speed of light. But it doesn't mean that uh, classical mechanics, as elucidated by, by Newton, is not correct in our sort of everyday uh, world. So the same way when people get frustrated uh, by scientists and they say, oh, you know, who can believe scientists these days? One day they say COVID gets tra transmitted by touching surfaces. And then a month later they say, no, it doesn't get transmitted by surfaces as much. So how can we believe that? Well, you know, what happens is that's the process of science. Science is a discovery and it constantly changes because we're constantly finding new things that present a, a more comprehensive and a more colorful, colorful picture of reality. So if physics changes, it's because we're going forward. It's because we are finding new ways of applying uh, our laws to the world and we're finding cases in which they don't operate that way. And so science is not about facts. It's about discovery and an ever-increasing, uh, more comprehensive view of reality and nature. So what would you say is the most mysterious aspect of our universe? Wow, there's so many hidden things in physics, like dark matter, like why is the universe expanding, like all this, is, string, is there some validity to string theory, to the string being composed of I'm sorry, the universe being composed of little strings and, uh, and the model of the, the, that we have, the standard model of all the particles that exist, uh, you know, is, is, is there something else that we're missing out there that could explain because of all the forces that we know of the world, gravity is incredibly weak. And it's just so weak compared to the nuclear forces and, uh, you know, the strong and the weak force and, and whatnot, that it's just a mystery to know why uh, gravity does not appear at, at the smaller scale. So how can we unify all these forces to have a more unified view of the universe by incorporating the force of gravity? I think that's a huge mystery. What's an ap academic topic outside of data science that you think every data scientist should spend some time researching on? Critical thinking. What's the number one book, fiction or nonfiction, that you would recommend our audience read and your most impactful takeaway from it? Richard Feynman's What Do You Care What Other People Think? I love it. Feynman is freaking amazing. I love that guy. Yeah. Uh, so if we could somehow get a magical telephone that allowed you to contact 20 year old Debbie, uh, what would you tell her first, first kind of tell us, you know, 20 year old, where, where were you at? Uh, you know, give us a little bit of context and then what would yes. you say to her? I was in Mexico city studying philosophy because a lot of people had told me that I wouldn't be able to do physics and I wouldn't be able to do quantitative things. So I would tell that Debbie to believe in herself to trust that uh, their, her desire, desires to, to do physics were valid and, and came from a valid place of curiosity. And what's more important in life is to, to pursue those uh, dreams that we have, even if we are not the best at them. I'd rather do that than stay doing something that comes easy to me, that I'm comfortable at, satisfy me because my true desire was to learn or do something else. That's what I would tell her. What's the best advice you've ever received? My husband is a physicist too, and his advisor told him uh, something that it has taken me years to understand. Uh, what he said is, hold your water. And I never quite understood what he meant by that. And uh, my husband always says, it's like if you are in a conversation where you, you are adversarial or you're coming to a, to a point where it's going to just end up frustrating both parties and you're not getting uh, 
kind of moving forward in the conversation, just maybe sometimes it's better to listen and to stay quiet and hold your water. That is, don't engage, don't try to be the, the one who's right, don't try to be the one who wins an argument, but hold your water, like stay back and, and, and try to understand uh, the other person better. So what motivates you? What motivates me is my children, is, is uh, creating a, a world where my three and a half year old told me the other day, mommy, can I do coding after the bath? And I almost cried because I'm teaching her coding with Code Emoji, which is a very sweet app or website. And, and they, they teach uh, coding to very young kids through emojis. And I don't know, it just give, brings me hope that uh, they can inherit a world where the work of all of the marvelous women uh, before me and after me are making uh, possible uh, that we can succeed and we can occupy many more positions than the ones that were available to us in the past. Do you have any tips for, for me as a brand new dad who's a nonstop skeptic raising a child in a family of believers? <laughs> yes. Uh, so I would recommend uh, buying books uh, by Ruth Spiro on science, like quantum mechanics for babies. And <laughs> they're so cute and thermodynamics for babies. And basically, educate your children to ask questions from the get go. Don't ever tell them that because you are their parent, uh, they should believe in you. They should, and I know it's much harder to, to bring them up that way, but tell them to question you. And that does not mean you're going to give them permission or you're going to agree with them, but they still have the right to question the why. And I, I tell you, the teachers of my daughter have told me, even at her young age, that what they admire the most about my daughter at at the young age of three, is that she is able to reason through anything. If they tell her not to do something in school, she responds very well as long as you explain to her why not. You know, because this is dangerous or because, you know, it's somebody else's turn or, you know, whatever uh, way. But reasoning uh, is, is a capacity that they can develop from an early age. And so try to build that. I have talks with her where she says, mommy, we need to have a talk. And we try to reason through things to arrive at a conclusion. And I may still disagree with her and, and you know, put the foot on the ground and say that you, you, you won't watch videos tonight. But at least she gets a chance to reason with me of why she thinks she should be watching videos. That's so awesome. I love it. So <laughs> what's, what's the song that you have on repeat right now? David Bowie, Changes. I love that song. Awesome. How can people, <laughs> how can people connect with you? Where can they find you? Um, everywhere in social media. My Twitter and Instagram handles are Debbie Barrett. That's D-E-B-B-I-E. -E, and then B as in boy, E-R-E. Debbie Barry. You can also find me on Facebook and LinkedIn uh, and hopefully on TikTok in the near future. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Berbichez, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to be here today. I really, really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a fantastic interview. I really, really enjoyed it.